Again, good morning, church, and welcome to our worship time here at Manchester. I hope, I hope you enjoy watching all those little ones hand out those flowers. If you do, say amen. amen. I know I do. I do. And, and again, if you're one of the ladies here in the room, I hope that you do experience that. Not, that's not some gimmicky thing we're trying to do just to give the children a way to participate. But we genuinely want that to convey our respect, our appreciation, our love for you. And I hope that, it, again, it shows you the kind of honor that, that we should show one another, that we're taught, even in the Word, to show one another as people of God. I started to say a few minutes ago as well that I know that Mother's Day isn't always an easy day for some people. For those of us who, who have or have had really good moms, it's a beautiful day, and it's a day when we know we should celebrate them and do all we can to spend some time with them and show them that kind of love that they showed for us even before our memories can retain it. Uh, but for other people, it's difficult. Uh, some of us, like me included, you know, lost my mom last September. And so this is the first Mother's Day without her. That's not an easy thing. And there are others in the room who are in a similar situation. I also know that there are ladies in the room who would have, I think, loved to have been uh, biologically a mom, but for whatever reason, haven't, haven't been able to do that. And I know the kind of hardship that is. Uh, Charity and I... Um, Whenever we decided we wanted to be parents, it took a few years before we were able to finally, uh, in our case, adopt Jaden and then have Ellie and Judah after that. And so during that period of time, that was a time of struggle for us as we looked around and we saw friends and relatives and peers having babies and celebrating and doing all those things. And, and, and we felt you know, that, that hunger and that loss of not being able to experience that for ourselves for a time. And so if that speaks to you, we, we understand what that's like. And while we celebrate, it's also a day when, when some weep, and that's okay. Because family is supposed to be able to take on both of those things. And we, as God's family, can do that. <clears throat> a few years ago, we started a, a, a new ministry here at Manchester that we really don't talk about too often, and that's fine. And we named it Oaks. <clears throat> so this is something that that I helped to start at the first church I was at a long time ago, 20 years ago in Arkansas. Then we carried it over and started it at the church we were at next in, in Wichita, Kansas. And then we came here and uh, the elders agreed a few years ago to let us start it again. And OAKS is an acronym that stands for Orphaned and At-Risk Kids. And while we here at Manchester have expanded that a little bit beyond what we did in the other places uh, to include like we do some things like... Um, Caitlin is, has been a big sponsor, sponsor, big uh, organizer of some events that we use some orc, some orc, good night, I can't talk, some oaks funds for in the past, whether that's presents at Christmas for some children who need it, or um, Amaris has helped through some of the caseload she has as a social worker uh, to, to be in contact with some families and some little ones that we've been able to bless in a variety of ways over the last few years. And some of that has been, you know, brought about through the springboard of Oaks. But what Oaks was initially started to do is help people open their homes to children through adoption. And that's a rare thing, uh, as you well know. It's, I don't know what the percentages are. I should ask you, Robert, to look it up. You're a percentage guy. You seem to come up with all these stats. But I, I don't know what the stats are of people who adopted or been adopted or whatever. But my family has been blessed through that process immensely in ways that, that, you know, are a blessing straight from God. And so we also are aware, and some of our other families here in church have been blessed through that as well, and have been a blessing to babies or, or juveniles or even adolescents who need a home and need a family and need to be, to be loved. But one of the most difficult things about that process is that it can be incredibly expensive and cost prohibitive. Where, where especially younger parents sometimes just can't do it because they can't afford to. But there are others in the congregation who can afford to help, but for other reasons can't or aren't at a stage of life where they're able to adopt for themselves. And so why not marry those two things together and match up those who have financial resources with those who have the ability to be an open home and a new family and so that's what Oaks is intended to do, to help provide some financial help to, the, to any of you within our congregation 
who have an interest in adopting but otherwise couldn't afford to do so. So if any of you have any interest in that or learning more about that, come and talk to me about it or talk to Nancy Volkert about it. She and I kind of co-lead that ministry together with a, with a lot of help from a lot of other really, really great involved people. And, and we would love for you uh, to receive a financial gift from that ministry if it meant you could bring a child into your home. Now, the reason I'm talking about that today isn't really because it's Mother's Day, but it's because we are thrilled to be able to announce that we are now engaged in helping someone here in the church who's not here at the moment, so I'm not going to spoil that surprise. We'll save that. But there's someone here in the church who is involved in an adoption process right now for a teenager, and we, through Oaks, are able to make a significant financial contribution to that process. And so many of you have been contributing to Oaks a little, little by little as we go, and I just want you to know, And if you're, because if you're wondering, well, are you ever going to do anything? The answer is yes, that God is at work in that, and so we're thrilled. And if you're excited about that, why don't we clap together for it, because I'm excited about that. And hopefully we can tell you a little bit more about that in the weeks to come. I want to share a poem with you this morning that I didn't write, and this is something I never, ever do. I, I grew up with preachers who was like, you know, three points in a poem, and that was the standard. And I got bored with that, so I just never done it. Uh, but I am this morning. It's a poem I came across about a decade ago. <clears throat> if you can, and I'm going to have to help you, get you guys to help me with the advancements because uh, the clicker doesn't work this morning. And this is a poem by Helen Steiner Rice called A Mother's Love. You probably can't read it, but I'm going to read it to you nonetheless. A mother's love is something that no one can explain. It is made of deep devotion and of sacrifice and pain. It is endless and unselfish and enduring, come what may, for nothing can destroy it or take that love away. It is patient and forgiving when all others are forsaking. And it never fails or falters, even though the heart is breaking. It believes beyond believing when the world around condemns. And it glows with all the beauty of the rarest, brightest gems. It is far beyond defining. It defies all explanation. And it still remains a secret, like the mysteries of creation. A many-splendored miracle man cannot understand, and another wondrous evidence of God's tender, guiding hand. Beautiful words, huh? Is there anything greater in the world than a mother's love for her child? The only thing I can think of that is greater, deeper, more powerful, more enduring than that is God's love for all of his children. As God tried to explain his own love for us, for his people, the depth of that love, the faithfulness of it, the rock steady, stronghold that he is for us. He, he chose to explain himself, to reveal himself to us as Father. We pray to him as Father. We read about him in Scripture. He's, he's spoken of over and over again as Father. And in part, it's because that image, especially in ancient cultures, especially there, you know, was the image that described the person who was the most powerful, who had the most authority, who was supposed to lead and guide and rule and protect and provide and nurture and sustain. And so that is who God is for us. But one of the things, and probably just because it's more rare in Scripture, one of the things that we we often miss, just don't know, is that God sometimes uses very, what we consider feminine images to express His emotion for us. Did you know that? That sometimes the way God describes himself are the ways we would usually think of uh, as ways to describe 
a mother. I want to show you a couple. If you would advance for me. The first scripture we're going to look at is Hosea chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. Now, Hosea was a prophet <clears throat> a long time, centuries before the birth of Jesus. And Hosea was a prophet who had a very difficult life, uh, a very difficult personal life, as God used Hosea and his broken family to communicate a message to God's own people, to God's own children, to God's own broken family. And so God says this, at, at a point in the ministry of Hosea where God is letting his people know that although they once were motherless and rejected and foreign and, and in essence unknown to God because they had, they had forsaken him, that God is forever faithful and gracious and forgiving and loving and that God was always at work to bring them back home. And so the Lord God says, when Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. Now the more they were called, the more they went away. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and burning offerings to idols. Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up in my arms, but they didn't know that I healed them. I led them with cords of kindness, with the bands of love, and I became to them as one who eases the yoke on their jaws, and I bent down to them and fed them. Do you hear all those motherly images? Do you ever think of God like that? Do you realize that God, while powerful, and kingly, do you realize that he's also gentle and affectionate and tender? I want you to think for a minute about the very best things about your mom, uh, the things that you love the most about her. And then again, I know, I know. Some of you didn't know your moms, or some of you didn't have good moms, and I understand that. But many of us, thanks to God, were blessed with, with incredibly good moms. And the things that you love the most about the one you called mom or mama or mommy, the things you love the most, all those things are found in the person of God. Some of the things I love the most about my mom were first her absolute dedication and commitment to God, her willingness to show me that, my, my family that, every day, every week, for her entire life. I love and miss from my mom her constant encouragement. I love how Looking back, my mom set really high standards for us and our family. But she didn't step back and just demand excellence. She set high standards and then she stepped in and helped us reach them. I love my mom's absolute, unshakable love and support. Do you have anybody in your life who gives you that? Someone who no matter what loves you. Someone who answers the phone every time you call. Someone who smiles every time you enter the room. My mom was like that. And our God, our God is like that. Mom always made me feel like I was good enough for her, and that's quite a gift. And she learned those things from God and from his spirit who lived powerfully in her. Our next passage, we hear God speak again to his people. This is in Isaiah chapter 49. And again, Isaiah is a, is a priest who works in Jerusalem. And God used Isaiah to prophesy over many, many decades to his people, who God said were rebellious, 
who had failed him, who had broken his heart, who had turned away, and though he had called them back again and again and again, you know, it's like you pay Tell them to clean your room, clean your room, clean your room. Don't date jerks like that. But they just keep on doing it. They just don't listen. They got to learn the hard way. Well, God knows what that's like too. And so God, uh, in this particular passage, speaks some words of hope to uh, people who were so often unworthy and rebellious. In Isaiah 49, starting in verse 13, He says, sing for joy, O heavens, and exult, O earth. Break forth, O mountains, into singing. For the Lord has comforted his people and will have compassion on his afflicted. But Zion said, oh, the Lord has forsaken me. My Lord has forgotten me. And God responds with these beautiful words. Can a woman forget her nursing child? that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? Oh, even these may forget. He says, even a mother might forget. Yet I will not forget you. Do you hear God? Do you hear him? And if he was, trust me, Israel was not a very good group of people at this point in time. And so if God could say that to them, then I hope you hear God say that to you. Listen again. He says, Can a woman forget her nursing child, that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? Well, even these may forget. Yet I will not forget you. Behold, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. That's an odd image can't claim to know exactly what he means by that. But I think part of it is the idea that his hands are so continually on us that the imprint of us cannot be taken away. Do you understand what I mean? If you grip something tightly, if you grip a baseball tightly in your hands for long enough, when you let the baseball go, what do you see? You see the seams. God says, we are engraved on the palms of his hands. What a beautiful image for that tender, compassionate, affectionate God to have for us. He is faithful to us when we've been less than perfect. He wants to gather us back to himself so that he can protect us and feed us, nurse us us, and help us to grow up to be more like him. It shouldn't be a surprise then that in the ministry of Jesus, we find at least one occasion when Jesus echoes that same kind of of imagery, that same kind of what we consider motherly love. And he doesn't do those things by accident, of course. And so when many of the religious leaders of Jesus' day refuse to believe in him, refuse to hear his teachings, then Jesus' heart was broken for his unbelieving, rebellious people. And he said this in Matthew chapter 23, verse 37. He said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often... What I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. And the emphasis for us this morning isn't that fact that there were people who were unwilling to return to God, but the emphasis I want us to cling to here is what Jesus says, how he describes his heart when he, when he looked down on a city that just wasn't listening, that just wouldn't get it. And he said, oh, how I wish, like a mother hen, like she, have you ever seen this happen? How they spread their wings and those little chicks literally run under and the hen just surrounds them, covers them, protects them. He says, how often I would long to gather you together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings. How, how often I would, 
I just wanted to bring you near to myself, to take care of you, to feed you, to protect you, to provide for you, to raise you up. But you wouldn't. It's a sad thing to miss an opportunity to be loved and gathered in close to the heart of God. But it's also a sad thing for us to neglect, for us to miss that kind of opportunity with the women in this life who have had such an impact on our own. Those of you like me, whose mothers have passed away, know how precious those memories and those moments are. So I want to I encourage you. I want to admonish you. All of you who are children, no matter how old you are, to remember that God, through His Word, tells you tells me how we are supposed to treat our mothers. Are you hearing me? You all know we're taught to honor our parents, but God says more than that. And so, Carter, if you'll help me go through these. There there we go. He tells us to honor and to respect her. Even when she's imperfect, God tells us to love her and obey her. Now that's true, especially when you're young. He tells us to listen to her instructions, to take her teaching to heart. He teaches us to take care of her in her old age and to never ever forget that she bore you, that she nursed and fed you, that she took care of every need you had when you could not possibly have survived on your own. And she did all those things for the very same reason that God continues to do all of those things. Because she loved you. If your relationship with your mother is a good one, rejoice in that. Celebrate it. Tell her again and again in all the ways that she feels love. If it's through a flower, if she's into that, give her flowers. If she's into help around the house, help around the house. If she's into cookies, Pat, no, no, Pat, let Beth make the cookies. Let me take that one back. But whatever she's into, whatever makes her feel loved and special, do it. And by, <laughs> by all means, not just today, not just on this day, when the world says here on this day, we're going to honor and celebrate our moms, but do it way more often than that, because the day will come when you won't be able to do that again, and you'll miss it. Trust me. Take my word for it. And if your mother isn't so good, if you don't have somebody you can think back to and think back to the good times and the good memories, if she didn't take good care of you, but if she hurt you or she neglected you or she abused you, well, God says, look to Him because you are still loved, because you are still accepted, because you are still alive and fed and clothed by His grace, that you are still important, that you are still good enough, that there is someone, not just someone, but the Lord God Almighty who smiles when you enter the room, who always listens when you need to talk, who was there for you on the day you were not just born, but was there for you on the day you were created, who will be there for you on the day you die, 
and whose voice and command will raise you up to life again when His Son comes back. That God will never leave you or forsake you. And so if you have seen a glimmer of that in the relationship you had in this life with ladies who were important to you in this life, then know the blessing of that. Let's pray. Dear God, we are, we are grateful to you. You've heard us pray this already today. If we've asked you to receive our praise, to receive our worship this morning, to bless this time for us to honor the ladies here amongst us. Lord, you already heard Malik express in such beautiful language the love and appreciation we have for our moms, our, for our grandmothers, for our aunties, for all of those people who bless our lives in your name, whether they knew it or not. And so, God, we ask you to pour out a special blessing on all of those women who both today and every day of our lives have helped us to feel important and loved. Dear Lord, dear Lord, please bless those among us today in a very special way, whether mothers or grandmothers or, or others who have stepped into the lives of, of little ones who continue to pour themselves out day in and day out. Dear God, we pray for those, for those ladies, for those moms who have to do it on their own, who never have a break, who don't have a, a nurturing partner to help carry that load and yet who keep on doing it and who keep on bringing their family into your presence to be part of the church, to raise them up in you. Lord, so many of us knew what that was to be raised just by a mom. And so we think back to the ways that you strengthened them so that they could strengthen us and God, we know that they found that grace and that peace and that endurance from you. So thank you. And thank you, God, for being our father, our mother, the, the great parent who made us, who purposed us, who has raised us to this, to this day and will continue to until there is no night and only day remains. Lord, we look forward to that day. We ask you to send your son quickly so that we can experience that life with all your faithful people again. And it's in the name of Jesus that the church prays. Amen. If we can be of any help or any assistance or any encouragement to you this morning, we always offer an invitation for people to come if they need prayer to make it known. If there are people who are ready to confess their faith in Jesus and to be baptized into him for the forgiveness of their sins, so that you can receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and start a brand new life, so you can be, in Jesus' words, born again in Him and start that new life fresh and forgiven today, then we're here to assist you with that as we always are. If you have any need at all, we invite you to come in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ as we stand and sing.